Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Kenny. I'm a, I am currently a junior studying computer science and I'm a former CSDTF. And I actually wish I had this when I was an underclassman and that's why I'm giving this seminar, so I hope you enjoy it. So this seminar is about technical interviews and all my resources can be found at this link, uh, if you, uh, this link right here. So, uh, uh, so a couple of resources. So I made a list of problems, actually quite a few problems, and also uh, a general resources uh, page where we can find uh, tips on how to prepare for an interview, tips on you know, what you should do during an actual interview, and as well as uh, how to approach problems and resources for you know, f future reference. Uh, it's all online. And just a preface, just to preface this uh, seminar, so a disclaimer like this should not, your interview preparation should not be limited to this list. This is only meant to be a guide and you should definitely, um, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt, but also use everything I use to help you in your interview preparation. Okay, so I'm gonna speed through the next few slides so we can get to the actual case studies. The structure of an interview for, uh, a, for a software engineering position typically is you know, 30 to 45 minutes, multiple rounds depending on the company. Uh, often you'll be coding on a whiteboard, so a whiteboard like this, but often on a smaller scale. If you're having a phone interview, you'll probably be using either CollabEdit or a Google Doc, so they can you know, see your, you live coding uh, while you're being interviewed over the phone. An interview itself is typically two or three problems testing your computer science knowledge, and it will almost definitely involve coding. So the types of questions that you'll see are usually data structures and algorithms, and in doing you know, these kinds of problems, they will ask you, like, what is the time and space complexity, big O. Uh, often, they also ask higher level questions, so designing like, a system. How would you lay out your code? You know, what interfaces, what classes, what modules do you have in your system, uh, and how do these interact together? So, data structures and algorithms, as well as designing systems. So, some general tips before we dive into our case studies. So I think the most important rule is always be thinking out loud. The interview is supposed to be your chance to show off your thinking process. The point of the interview is, to sh is for the interviewer to gauge how you think and how you go through about a problem. The worst thing you can do is be silent throughout the whole interview. That's just no good. Uh, to, so when you are given a question, you also want to make sure you understand the question. So repeat the question back in your own words and attempt to work through a a few and simple test cases to make sure you understand uh, the question. Working through uh, a few test cases will also give you intuition on how to solve this problem. You might even discover a few patterns that may help you solve the problem. Uh, another big uh, tip is to don't get frustrated. That's, don't get frustrated. Uh, interviews are challenging, but the worst thing you can do, in addition to being silent, is to be visibly frustrated. It's, you do not want to give that impression to an interviewer. Uh, one thing that uh, you, so many people when they go in an interview, they attempt to try to find the best solution first, when really there's usually a glaringly obvious solution. It might be slow, it might be inefficient, but you should just state it just so you have a starting point from which to work better. Also, pointing out the solution is slow in terms of big O time complexity or space complexity will, will demonstrate to an interviewer that you understand these issues when writing code. So don't be afraid to come up with the most, you know, come up with the simplest algorithm first and then work better from there. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So let's dive into our first problem. Given an array of n integers, write a function that shuffles the array in place such that all permutations of the n integers are equally likely. Uh, and assume you have available a random integer generator that generates an integer in a range from zero to i, uh, half, half range. So you don't understand this question? I give you an array of n integers, and I want you to shuffle it. Uh, so in my directory, I wrote a few programs to demonstrate what I mean. So I am gonna shuffle an array of 20 elements from negative 10 to positive nine. And I want you to output a list like this. So this was my sorted input array, and I want you to shuffle it. Do it again. 
to under, or everyone understand the question? Okay. So it's up to you. Like, what, what, are, what are some ideas? Can you do this n squared, n log n, n? Uh, open to suggestions. Okay, so one idea suggested by Emmy is first compute a random number, random integer, in a range from 0 to 20. So assume our array has length 20. So in our diagram of 20 elements, this is our input array. And now her suggestion is to create a new array. So this would be the output array. And based on the i returned by rand, so if i was, let's say, 17, copy the 17th element into the first position. And now we need to delete, we, we need to shift all the elements here over so that we have a gap at the end and no holes in the middle. And now we repeat the process. So now we compute a new random integer between 0 and 19. So we have a new i here. And we copy this element into this position. And then we shift items over. And we repeat the process until we have our full uh, new array. So what is the runtime of this uh, algorithm? Well, let's consider the impact of this. We are shifting every element. So when we remove this i, we are shifting all the elements after it to the left. And that is an O of n cost. Because what if we remove the first element? So for each removal, we remove, uh, each removal incurs an O of n operation. And since we have n removals, this leads to an O of n squared shuffle. OK. So good start. Good start. So another suggestion is to use something known as the Canoe Shuffle or the Fisher Yates Shuffle. And it is actually a linear time shuffle. And the idea is very similar. So again, we have our input array. But instead of using two arrays for our input output, we use the first portion of the array to, main, to keep track of our shuffled portion. And we keep track. And then we leave the rest of our array for the unshuffled portion. So here's what I mean. We start off with, and we choose an i. Um, in a range from 0 to 20. Let's say we choose. So currently, um, w our current pointer is pointing to the first index. We choose some i here. And now we swap. So if this was uh, 5 and this was 4, the resulting array we'll have 5 here and 4 here. And now we note a marker here. Everything to the left is shuffled. Everything to the right is unshuffled. And now we can repeat the process. We choose a random index between 1 and 20 now. So suppose our new i is here. So now we swap, so now we swap this i with our current new position here. And so we do a swapping back and forth like this. So let me bring up the code to make it more concrete. So we start with a, we start with our choice of i. Where we, so we start with i equal to zero. We pick a random location j in the unshuffled portion of the array i to n minus one. So if I'm here, choose a random index between here and the rest of the array. 
and we swap. And this is all the code necessary to shuffle your array. Any questions? Well, one immediate question is, why is this correct? Like, why is every permutation equally likely? And I won't go through the proof of this, but many problems in computer science can be proven through induction. Uh, how many of you are familiar with induction? Okay, cool. So you can prove the correctness of the, uh, this algorithm by simple induction, where um, your induction hypothesis would be assume that my shuffle returns every permutation equally likely up to the first you know, i elements. Now consider i plus 1. And by the way we choose our index j to swap, this leads to, in any work out of details, this leads to a full proof of why this algorithm returns every permutation with equally likely probability. All right, next problem. So you're given an array of n integers, positive, zero, and negative. Write a function that calculates the maximum sum of any continuous subarray of the input array. So an example here is, in the case where all numbers are positive, then clearly the best choice is to take the whole array. 1, 2, 3, 4 equals 10. When you have some negatives in there, in this case, we just want the first two, because choosing negative 1 and or negative 3 will bring our sum down. Sometimes we might have to start in the middle of the array. Sometimes we want to choose nothing at all. It's best to not take anything. And sometimes it's better to you know, take the fall, because the thing after it is you know, super big. So, any ideas? <coughs> yeah. So, suppose I don't take negative one. Then either I choose you know, 1,000 and 20,000, or I just choose the 3 billion. Well, the best choice is take all the numbers. You know, this negative one, despite being negative, uh, the whole sum is better than if I were not to take negative one. So one of the tips I mentioned earlier was state the, the clearly obvious and the brute force solution first. So what is the brute force solution in this problem? Yeah. I think the brute, brute force solution would be to add up all the possible combinations of the standard root of the root biggest. Okay, so uh, Jane's idea is to take every possible continuous, sub it, uh, I'm paraphrasing, is to take every possible continuous subarray, compute its sum, and then take the maximum of all the possible continuous subarrays. So what uniquely identifies a subarray in my input array? Like what two things do I need? Yeah. Lower right, so a lower bound on index and the upper bound on index uniquely determines a continuous subarray. So are we assuming it's an array of unique numbers? No. So her question is, are we assuming our array is our array all unique numbers? And the answer is no. So if we use our brute force solution, then the start n indices uniquely determines our continuous subarray. So if we iterate for all possible start entries and for all n entries greater than or equal to start and less than n, you compute the sum and then we take the maximum sum we've seen so far. Is this clear? What is the big O of this solution? Time wise. So n not quite n squared. Note that we have, we iterate from start to, we iterate from zero to n, so that's one for loop. We iterate again um, from almost you know, beginning to the end, another for loop. And now within that, we have to sum up every entry, so that's another for loop. So we have three nested for loops. n cubed. n cubed. Okay. So this goes to the starting point. Our Solution is no worse than n cubed. OK. Does everyone understand brute force solution? OK. So a better solution is to use an idea called dynamic programming. And if you take CS 124, which is algorithm of data structures, you will become very familiar with this technique. And the idea is 
try to build up solutions to smaller problems first. And what I mean by this is we currently have to worry about two things, start and end. And that's annoying. Like, what if we could get rid of one of those parameters? So one idea is to, you know, we given our original problem, find a maximum sum of any subarray in a range, 0 to n minus 1. And now we have a new subproblem where we just we know in our current index i, we know we must include there. Our subarray must end at the current index. So the, so the remaining problem is where do we where should we start our subarray? Does this make sense? Okay. And let's so I've coded this up. And let's look at you know, what this means. So I wrote up in, the, in the code directory, there's a program called subarray. And it takes a number of items. And it returns the maximum subarray sum in uh, my shuffled list. So in this case, our maximum subarray is 3. And that's taken by just using 2 and 1. Let's run it again. It's also a 3. But this time, look, note how we got the 3. We took the, f uh, we just take the 3 itself. Because negative, it's surrounded by negatives on both sides, which will bring the sum less than negative 3. Bring the sum less than 3. It's running on 10 items. This time it's 7. We take the leading 3 and 4. This time it's 8. And we obtain that by taking 1, 4, and 3. So to give you intuition on uh, how we can solve this you know, transformed problem, let's take a look at this subarray. So we're given this input array, and we know the answer is 8. We take the 1, 4, and 3. But let's look at how we actually got that answer. Let's look at the maximal subarray that ended at each of these indices. So What's the maximal subarray that has to end at uh, the first position? Zero. Zero. Don't, just don't take the negative 5. So here, it's going to be 0 as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. This is a negative 3. So this is a 2. This is a negative 3. OK. So. Negative 4, what's the maximal subarray that ends at the position where negative 4 is at? 0. 1. 1. 5. 8. Now, I, I must end at the location where negative 2 is at. So 6. 5. 7. And last one is 4. So knowing that these are my entries uh, for, a, for a transformed problem where I must end at each of these indices, then my final answer is just take a sweep across and take the maximum number. So in this case, it's 8. This implies that the maximal subarray ends at this index and started somewhere before it. So does everyone understand this transformed subarray? Yeah. OK. Well, let's figure out the recurrence for this. <coughs> so let's consider just the first few entries. So here it was 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, 5, and that there's a negative 2 here, and that brought it down to 6. So if I call the entry at position i sub problem i, how can I uh, use the answer to previous sub problems to answer this sub problem? So if I look at, let's say, this entry, how can I compute 
the answer six by looking at a combination of this array and the answers to previous subproblems in this array. Yes? Um, do you take the array of sums in the position right before it, so the eighth, and you add the current subproblem at? So her suggestion is to look at these two numbers, this number and this number. So this eight refers to the answer for a subproblem i minus one. And let's call my input array A. So in order to find a maximal subarray that ends at position i, I have two choices. I can either continue the subarray that ended at the previous index or start a new, in or start a new array. So if I were to continue the subarray that started at the previous index, then the maximum sum I can achieve is the answer to the previous subproblem plus the current array entry. But I also have the choice of starting a new subarray, in which case the sum is zero. So the answer is max of zero comma subproblem i minus one plus the current uh, array entry. Does this recurrence make sense? So our recurrence, as we just discovered, is subproblem i is equal to the maximum of the previous subproblem plus my current array entry, which, which, uh, which means continue the previous subarray, or zero, start a new subarray at my current index. And once we have built up this table of solutions, then our final answer, just do a linear sweep across the subproblem array and take the maximum number. So this is an exact implementation of what I just said. So we create a new subproblem array, subproblems. The first entry is either zero or the first entry, the maximum of those two. And for the rest of the subproblems, <coughs> Uh, we use the exact recurrence we just discovered. And now we compute the maximum of our subproblems array, and that's our final answer. So how much space are we using in this algorithm? So if you've only taken CS50, then you might not have, this, might not have discussed space very much. Uh, well, one thing to note is that I call malloc here with size n. So what does that suggest to you? This algorithm uses linear space. Can we do better? Is there anything that you notice that you know, is unnecessary to compute the final answer? Uh, I guess a better question is, what information do we not need to carry all the way through to the end? And if we look at these two, uh, these two lines, we only care up about the previous subproblem, and we only care about the maximum we've ever seen so far. To compute our final answer, we don't need the entire array. We only need the last number, last two numbers. Uh, last number for the subproblem array, and the last number for the maximum. So in fact, we can fuse these loops together and uh, go from linear space to constant space. Current sum so far here takes, replaces the role of subproblem, our subproblem array. So current sum so far is the answer to the previous subproblem. And max sum so far takes the place of our max. So we compute the maximum as we go along. And so we go from linear space to constant space and we also have a linear solution to our subarray problem. So these kinds of questions you will get during an interview. What is the time complexity? What is the space, what is the space complexity? Can you do better? Is there things that are unnecessary to keep around? And I, just, I, I did this to highlight you know, analyses that you should take on your own as you're working through these problems. Like, always be asking yourself, can I do better? And in fact, can we do better than this? So 
sort of a trick question? You can't, because you need to at least read the input to the problem. So the fact that you need to at least read the input to the problem means that you can't do better than linear time, and you can't do better than constant space. So this is, in fact, the best solution to this problem. Questions? OK. So stock market problem. Given an array of n integers, positive, 0, or negative, to represent the price of a stock over n days. Write a function to compute the maximum profit you can make, given that you buy and sell exactly one stock within these n days. So essentially, you want to buy low, sell high. And you want to figure out the best profit you can make. So going back to my tip, what is the immediately you know, clear, simplest answer, but is slow? Yes. Um, I'm assuming that you're doing this after the iteratory occurred. Yes, yes. Yeah, so you would just go through and look at the stock prices at each point in time and pick out the lowest one and the highest one. And the, the highest, the lowest one and the highest, oh, actually. Hmm. Okay, so her solution, her, her suggestion of computing the lowest and computing the highest doesn't necessarily work yeah, because, because the highest, highest might occur high. before the lowest. So what, what is the brute force solution to this problem? Like, what are the two things that I need to uniquely determine the profit I make? Yeah. Right. So the brute force solution is, uh, so George's suggestion is we only need two days to uniquely determine the profit of those two days. So we compute every pair, like buy, sell, compute the profit, which could be negative or positive or, or negative or, or zero. Compute the maximum profit that we make uh, after iterating all over all pairs of days. That will be our final answer. And that solution would be O of n squared because there's n choose two uh, pairs of days that you can choose f f among n days. OK, so I'm not going to go over the brute force solution here. So I'm, I'm going to tell you that there's a n log n solution. And what algorithm do you currently know is n log n? It's not a trick question. Sorting. Merge sort. So merge sort uh, is n log n. And in fact, one way of solving this problem is to use a merge sort kind of idea called, in general, divide and conquer. Um, and the idea is as follows. You want to compute the best buy sell pair in the left half. Find the best profit you can make just with the first n over two days. Now you want to compute the best buy sell pair on the right half, so the, the right last n over two days. And now the question is how do we merge these solutions back together? Right. Uh, yes? Okay. So let me draw a picture. So, yes? Exactly. So George's solution is exactly right. So his suggestion is first compute the best buy sell pair in a, in that, that occurs in the left half. So let's call that left, left. Best buy sell pair that occurs in the right half. But if we only compare these two numbers, we're missing the case where we buy here and sell somewhere in the right half. So we buy in the left half, buy in the right half. And the best way to compute the best buy-sell pair that spans both halves is to compute the minimum here and compute the maximum here and take their difference. So the two cases where the buy-sell pair occurs only here, only here, or on both halves um, is defined by these three numbers. So our algorithm to merge our solutions back together 
we want to compute the best buy-sell pair where we buy in the left half and sell in the right half. And the best way to do that is to compute the lowest price in the first half, the highest price in the right half, and take their difference. And the resulting three profits, these three numbers, you take the maximum of the three, and that's the best answer, that's the best profit you can make over these course of n days. So here, uh, the important lines are in red. This is a recursive call to compute the answer in the left half. This is a recursive call to compute the answer in the right half. These two for loops compute the min and the max on the, on the left and right half, respectively. Now I compute the profit that spans both halves. And the final answer is the maximum of these three. OK. So sure, we have an algorithm, but the bigger question is, what is the time complexity of this? And the reason why I mentioned merge sort is that this, for this form of you know, dividing the answer into two and merging our solutions back together is exactly the form of merge sort. So let me go through the derivation. So if we define a function t of n to be the number of steps uh, for stocks for, for n, n days, our two recursive calls are each going to cost t of n over 2. And there's two of these calls. Now I need to compute the maximum, the minimum of the left half, which is which I can do in n over two time, plus the maximum of the right half. So this this is just n, and then plus some constant work. Does this so and this this recurrence equation is, is exactly the recurrence equation for merge sort. And we all know that merge sort is n log n time. So therefore, our algorithm is also n log n time. Does this derivation make sense? Uh, just a brief um, recap of this. T of n is the number of steps to compute the maximum profit over the course of n days. The way we split up uh, our recursive calls is by calling you know, our, answer, our solution on the first at n over two days. So that, that's one call. And then we call it again on the second half. So that's two calls. And then we find a minimum of the left half, which we can do in linear time. Find a maximum of the right half, which we can do in linear time. So n over two plus n over two is just n. And then we have some constant work, which is like doing arithmetic. And this recurrence equation is exactly the recurrence equation for merge sort. Hence, our shuffle algorithm is also n log n. Uh, yeah. So how much space are we using? Let's go back to the code. So a better question is, how many stack frames do we ever have at any given moment? Since we're using recursion, the number of stack frames determines our space usage. Let's consider n equals 8. So we call you know, shuffle on 8. which we'll call shuffle on the first four entries, which we'll call shuffle on the first two entries. So our stack is, this is our stack. And then we call shuffle again on one. And that's one of our base cases, so we return immediately. Do we ever have more than this many stack frames? No. because 
each time we do an invocation, a recursive invocation to shuffle, we divide our size in half. So the maximum number of stack frames we ever have at any given moment is on the order of log n stack frames. Each stack frame has, so each stack frame has constant space. And therefore, the total amount of space, the, the maximum amount of space we ever use is O of log n space, where n is the number of days. OK. Now, always ask yourself, can we do better? And uh, in particular, can we reduce this to a problem we have already solved? And a hint, we only discussed two other problems before this, and it's not going to be shuffle. So we can convert the stock market problem into the maximal subarray problem. And uh, how can we do this? One of you? Emmy? Exactly. So, uh, so the maximal subarray problem. We're looking for the uh, sum over a continuous subarray. And Emmy's suggestion is for the stocks problem. Consider the changes or the deltas. And a picture of this is this is the price of a stock. But if we took the difference between each consecutive day, uh, so we see that the maximum price, maximum profit we can make is if we you know, buy here and sell here. But let's look at the continuous, let's look at the subarray problem. So here, we can make, uh, uh, so, go, so going from here to here, we have a positive change. And then going from here to here, we have a negative change. Uh, but then, uh, from going from here to here, we have a huge positive change. And these are the changes that we want to sum up to get our final profit. And then we have uh, more negative changes here. So the key to reducing our stock problem into our maximal subarray problem is to consider the deltas between days. So we can create a new array called the deltas. Initialize the first entry to be zero. And then for each delta i, let that be the difference of my input array i and array i minus one. And then we call our routine procedure for maximal subarray, passing in a deltas array. And because maximal subarray is linear time, and this reduction, this process of creating this delta array is also linear time, then the final solution for stocks is O of n work plus O of n work is still O of n work. So we, we have a linear time solution to our problem. Does everyone understand this transformation? So in general, a good idea that you should always have is try to reduce a new problem that you're seeing if it looks familiar to an old problem, try reducing it to an old problem. And if we can use all the tools that you've used on the old problem to solve the new problem. OK, so some wrap up. Technical interviews are challenging. So these problems are probably one of the more difficult problems that you might see in an interview. So if you don't understand all the problems that I just covered, it's OK. It, these are some of the more, more challenging problems. Uh, practice, practice, practice. Uh, I gave 
a lot of problems in the handout, so definitely check those out. And good luck on interviews. Uh, all my resources are posted at this link. And one of my senior friends has offered to do mock technical interviews. So if you're interested, email Willie Yao at that email address. And uh, if you have some questions, you can ask me. Uh, do you guys have specific questions related to technical interviews or any problems we've seen so far? Okay, well, good luck on your interviews.